uh, and uh, my mother's family as well. Uh, my father was uh, born in a little town in Russia at approximately 1890. Uh, uh, his father uh, was, uh, was, uh, had a tea shop in this little town, and the villagers would come and he would sell them tea and cookies or whatever else he had there. Uh, my father was the oldest of about eight children, and he was the only one that came to America at about 1914-1915. Uh, none of his other siblings or his parents followed him. He was the only one that came here. The only relative he had here was, a, was an uncle that lived in upstate New York, and he spent a short time living with him before he then uh, uh, found a friend who lived in Springfield, Illinois. So he then went to Springfield, Illinois, where he learned his trade, which was a baker. But what, what town was your, fa your father from? My father originally was from a little town in Russia called Khmelnik. It was uh, one of the, uh, it was a small village uh, close to Kiev in the Ukraine. So here he was in Chicago, in, in America, and he was down in Springfield and learned his trade as a baker and then had a friend who wanted him to open up a shop in Chicago. So he came up to Chicago. Now at that time, uh, just as he was getting started, the First World War began and he went into the army and served a, a year or two in the service as a baker. Uh, and uh, during that time he met my mother and they were married in 1919. Where, where did he meet her? Uh, he met her at a party from the, uh, uh, the people who came from the small villages all had what they called forains and they would get together and reminisce and talk about the old country and form friendships between them. And at one of those meetings he met my mother. Uh, at the same time my uncle met my mother's sister and they got married, the four of them. Um, and this was in 1919 when my father returned from service. In 1920, my two sisters were born. They were twins. They were born in 1920. I was born in um, 1925. Uh, right? Uh, what what my day? Father, uh, <laughs> I grew up in Chicago, in a small town. My father had the uh, bakery in Chicago. And uh, we all lived close by, either above it or next door to the bakery. Where, where was the bakery? And we all were, it was in Chicago on Potomac Avenue, is which is the northwest side of Chicago. You remember the, you remember the address? Uh, 2510 West Potomac Avenue. I don't remember the phone number, but I remember <laughs> that. Uh, we all, my sisters and I and my parents we all grew up in a very small apartment, which was uh, really a cold water apartment. Uh, but we all managed, uh, the rooms were very tiny, and uh, we lived there uh, successfully uh, uh, At that time, of course, I went to grammar school and high school in Chicago. Right. graduated from high school, Tooley High School. But the, the, uh, so what was it like when your father first, first came here? I mean, so, so, uh, well, when my father, just to backtrack, was it okay if I go back? Yeah. When my father first came to America, he had no one except his uncle in New York, mm -hmm. who he hardly knew. So he showed up in New York, and at that time, um, he had to go sleep in a, in a what they call a steam bath, because he had no mm -hmm. place to stay and no money. Until the following day, or two days later, when his uncle came and got him, and took him to upstate New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Unfortunately, the situation with his uncle in upstate New York was not very successful because it, he was married to a, it was a second marriage and she resented all the children they had and times were not very good at that point and that's why they wanted to ship my father off somewhere and he found this opportunity to go to Springfield, Illinois with a friend and learn a trade. Uh, How come he was the only one that came over? I mean, why did he come over originally? He was the oldest and apparently things were pretty tough there. In, in Europe, and uh, somebody had to go, and my father was chosen. That's the best answer I ever had. Mm -hmm. My mother, on the other hand, uh, grew up in a, a suburb of Kiev, and uh, uh, she came from a family that was much more educated, much more sophisticated, and, and worldly. Uh, she came to her. She came to America with her sister, which was your aunt Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and she came here, according to what she said, is because she was harassed by the soldiers and harassed by the uh, villagers. Uh, it was uh, during the time where there were still pogroms in Russia, and uh, she was unhappy and came here. Now she brought over uh, two other sisters and brought over my grandparents, my mother's parents. Mm -hmm. They all came here. My, my maternal grandparent died when I was about three years old, so my memory of her is very vague. But my maternal grandfather, I remember very well. He helped me during my bar mitzvah time. And mm -hmm. uh, he lived with one of my uh, aunts, and he would be at our house regularly. So I remember him quite vividly. I was about uh, 14 when he died, about that. Um, so, so your father ended up in Springfield? So while he was in Springfield, and then he went to Chicago, so, so, right, so, then he went to the Army. Right, so, so you said he was in Springfield, and why did he become, do you know why he became a baker? It was because his, that's what his friend was. Oh, it was. Yeah, I mean, that's what they said here, you're here now, we'll make you a baker, just like his friend. Uh, so how long was he in Springfield for? Uh, he was there a relatively short time, I would say a couple of years. I was never very clear about that. So why did he come to Chicago? He came to Chicago because he had another friend who wanted to open up a little bakery shop with him. Right. So he came to Chicago to do that. Uh, but just as he got it started, the war broke out, and then he went into the Army. Why, why did he go in the Army? Was he drafted, or was it volunteered? Uh, or? I probably was drafted. I, I don't remember clearly whether, I doubt if he volunteered. He probably was drafted. He, pro he may have volunteered, because at that time, if you volunteered for the Army, you became a citizen instantly. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to wait for a period of time and go through uh, tests and all that to, be, to maintain your American citizenship. You became a citizen immediately. So you may have gone into the Army in order to obtain the citizenship. And at that time, also, when he got married, my mother became a citizen by virtue of the fact that he was a citizen. So it was, a, it was an interesting time. Uh, but, but he met her before, after he was in the Army? He met her after he was in the Army. Right. Just very shortly, and they got married very shortly after that. And what did, what did he do in the Army? He was a baker. Did he, 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 was, did he go overseas? He or? never went overseas. Uh, he was with, with a company, and the story he tells us is that he didn't go overseas because the captain, it was, this was a training group, the captain liked his cooking so much that he, even though the unit went overseas, the captain kept him back because the captain remained there. And he uh, he never got overseas, so and he was in stationed somewhere in Texas. Um, and he cooked for the. He cooked for the soldiers. He was an army cook, and uh, uh, that's why when he opened the bakery, he was accustomed to cooking in large quantities. That was nothing unusual for him. In fact, years later, when he retired, he started. He tried to cook at home. And of course, he didn't know how to cook in small quantities, and he made a mess of everything because he was—he only knew the numbers for making a hundred breads and not for making one bread. He—he uh, he retired. My dad had the bakery for, for years, and he retired uh, in the late fifties. Uh, at that at that time. And he did try working as a baker, but it was not very successful. It wasn't a very successful bakery work. It kept burning his hands because oh, oh. technology had changed. And uh. had different kinds of ovens and different kinds of machinery that, that he wasn't accustomed to. Um, so he, anyway, he retired and lived uh, uh, in Chicago until my mother died, which was in 1960. And shortly after that, he moved to Florida and lived in Miami, South Miami Beach. And he lived there uh, until just about the time he died, which was, uh, I don't know. Like, like uh, 78? Yeah, late 70s. Late 70s. So you said your father, father, wasn't he in the Yiddish theater for a while when he was a young guy? Well, there's a, there's a picture of him in mm -hmm. a costume as a Russian uh, Cossack of some kind. And uh, apparently he was in some type of a theatrical performance at one time. Mm -hmm. um, never talked too much about it, so I don't know how active he was actually. He may have been in a few performances. But, there, but we did have a picture of him in this, in this uniform, in a costume really, uh, which, uh, which he did when he was 
performing. Um, at that time, uh, there were a lot of organizations and they did a lot of theatrical things, they did a lot of performances, they did all sorts of social things. Mm -hmm. It was a very social time. I remember as a little boy going to all these meetings that they had of the people who came from the different uh, communities in, basically in Russia uh, because my uncle came from another little town called Nikolai and they had their own group and we would go visit them and my father went to a group from Melnik, my mother had a group from Kiev and everybody had their own little group from, from the community they came right. from in Russia and they were, it was a very busy socially active organization uh, what happened to the organizations, though, when the boys came home from service in World War II, no one was interested in getting involved in the organizations. They didn't have the same kind of attachments uh, as the parents did. So the organizations just died out. They just disbanded. They tried to get the young men involved, but it was not very successful. Um, so, so what else did he do besides be a baker? That was enough. Raise the family. You know, be a baker and raise the family. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, basically uh, his life's work. Did, did, did he enjoy any of that? Did he think he liked being uh, a baker? I think there were times. I think there were things he did that were enjoyable. I think that he had some good years at the end. I think he worked very hard. You know, the, when he started out, they worked seven days a week. Mm -hmm. He worked very long hours. Um, you know, he was up at two thirty, three o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, didn't get back to home until probably. Three or four in the afternoon, and uh, it was was a tough life. It was a very tough life at that time. Um, but uh, he did it, and he raised his family. And I think everybody was working hard, so it wasn't anything unusual for him. Um, he did uh, after he retired. He moved to Florida. I think he had some good years there. He was socially active in different uh, in the temple and different organizations. Um, he joined the uh, war veterans, Jewish war veterans. Mm -hmm. So he had a social life down there. I'll let Violet tell you about her mother. Who well, that's that's how that's the whole her mother story. Yeah, that's another uh, story. So uh, 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 what and what then, else? Yeah, go ahead. Um, and uh, pretty much that was my father's life. My mother, as I say, she died relatively young. <coughs> she was in her early sixties, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Somewhere in the early mid 60s. Um, what else? As far as my life was concerned. Right, I have more questions. So, how successful do you think the bakery was? It successful as a bakery? Was it well known? Well, the bakery, bakery was successful until the Depression came. See, in fact, my father had a partner. There were two, two families working in that bakery. Mm -hmm. And apparently, it was doing well in supporting the two families. However, when the Depression came, uh, there just wasn't enough money for two families, so they, they decided to split. And my father stayed with the original bakery, and his partner moved to the south side of Chicago and opened another bakery, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, he made, made a living. I mean, he, I think it was comfortable. I never really felt the impact of the Depression. I mean, we always had uh, money for whatever is reasonable. We took vacations. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure it was tough. I'm sure my father, you know, just barely got by, and he had a, he probably had a uh, going to death at times and whatever he had to do. But uh, we always had, you know, food and clothes. And uh, when I was bar mitzvah, which was in 1938, which was still the, very much a depression, they still had a big party for me, uh, and he was able to do that, uh, which. A lot of people could barely afford food, and he was giving a party. So I, I think he was doing. I mean, was well, it was considering it, the uh, right. circumstances? It was a considered a famous, not a famous bakery, but it was well respected. It was a neighborhood or? bakery. Yeah, it was a neighborhood bakery, and they knew who he was, and he was known among the bakers in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, he he wasn't uh, terribly successful. It was a little neighborhood bakery, which. Uh, which uh, was a, was adequate for his needs and his abilities, I think. Um, did, he have any, did he have any specialties or anything that they made, or anything like known for? No, uh, they made everything. They made everything. Uh, bread. They made bread and cakes and cookies and donuts and 
Bagels. It was a bakery. I mean, he did all this bakery stuff. Uh, that was before the day of specialization, where there was no Krispy Kremes. I think that uh, was very popular at that time. Uh, and uh, that that that's the the um, highlights. I think. Milo, is there anything that I'm forgetting? Well, it's hard for me to say because. All your growing up years, you were doing things with your family. Yeah, well, as far as the growing up years, I mean, as I say, we took vacations and we went out to the country, and, <clears throat> and we did we did things as a family. You know, we used to go to to Navy Pier in Chicago, which mm -hmm. was a very famous uh, place to go. They had all sorts of games and carnivals and music and dancing and a lot of things for children to do. And uh, I went to Riverview Park, which was an amusement park in Chicago, unfortunately closed in 68. 68. Uh, but uh, we, we, we did things as a family. We, we had little experiences, a couple little experiences that are just interesting. Like what? Is my father, we grew up in the city, in the heart of the city. I mean, you know, even though there were some parks, still it was city. So we went out in the country and we were going to have a picnic and there was this great big open area so we decided that my father pulled the car over to the side of the road and uh, we were going to set up a picnic and some guy came running down from on the other side of the hill and it was his front yard it was a farm and this was his property you know anybody coming out of his property but we didn't know that so we packed up and we took off another time we went out for a ride and little community outside of Chicago called St. Charles and my father got caught for speeding and they arrested him and uh, this was during the depths of the depression they didn't carry much money with them they so they took him to jail and they put my father in a cell and my two sisters my mother and I sat on a bench outside of the cell because he didn't have twenty dollars to pay the fine so he called his partner he was still had a partner then in Chicago and the partner came, drove out there to pay the $20 fine so my father could get out of jail. But those are little incidents that happened. Uh, um, but those are things that happened as a family. I mean, we were all together mm -hmm. at that time. Um, so you didn't have any hobbies or any things he liked to no, read? No. What did, did he like to read certain things? Or he liked to argue politics? Well, or? He, he was, yeah, he was politically oh. astute. I mean, he, he thought about politics and he, he read, read a lot of Jewish books. Uh, but I don't think he had any particular hobbies as we would consider hobbies. Uh, that wasn't part of the lifestyle at that point. I think the men were very busy earning a living and doing their jobs and uh, hobbies was, was a luxury. Um, how, how, when, he got to, when he retired? Did he pick up any? Did he not really? Well, I don't know too much about that because he lived in Florida. And we would only see him occasionally. So um, I, I know, as I said, I know he was he joined the Jewish War Veterans. He became very active in the temple. Uh, I don't know what else he did. I know he, he used to go swimming and he exercised. And uh, but I don't know of anything else. No, but that was you know they, they lived a very active life there. Yeah, they lived an active, active, they an active social involved. life. Yeah, they yeah, lived, yeah. lived an active social life. So a lot of friends. I said they had friends and people there. And we used to go down, and so we were little. I would go down there every spring. I don't know if you remember, but we went down there and visited with them. Yeah, we went down. I I went down sometimes with just Murray and I. Um, we went down as a family together, uh, and then we continued going down. Mother and I, after you guys grew up and, and left, uh, we would go down and visit. Uh, my dad and her mother and my sister, all of whom lived in the Miami area. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, ultimately, uh, we bought a place and had a, an apartment in, in uh, Kendall, which is uh, right next to Coral Gables in Florida. Oh, you should tell us tell a story about you, the guy in the bus, talking about he was getting married again? Oh, that was sort of my father. Uh, this was, uh, we were all down in Florida one year, we were sitting out, and there was a tram on Lincoln Avenue. It was, uh, small tram that took you up and down the street. Um, and uh, my children and my Lila and myself were sitting there with my father. And a man gets on the tram and sits down next to my father. 
and begins a very serious discussion about his, his personal life and about whether he should get married to this woman. He's, he's uncertain about whether he should marry her and he's even uncertain about how active he needs to be sexually because these were men now in their late 60s, 70s. And he has this very complicated and intimate conversation with my father. And at one of the stops, the man gets up and he shakes hands with my father and he gets off. So I turn to my father and I say, who was that man? My father shrugs his shoulders and says, I have no idea. I don't know who he is. <laughs> but that's how the people in Miami were. They were very intimate with one another. Uh, there was a lot of open discussion about, you see, go to a restaurant, you see two older people sitting there talking about whether they should live together or not, and who's going to pay what, and uh, how much money they have, and all sorts of intimacies that you saw. But that was Miami during the... Uh, during the 70s, I guess. Yeah, until he died. Yeah. He was, uh, he was deep in his 80s by the time he... Uh, well, he did. He died. He was uh, uh, he was 88 or so, something like that. He was 88, 89. He was never really sure about the date of his birth. He, he thought he was born around 1890. Uh, and he died in... Uh, uh, 78. 78 or something like that. I don't remember the exact date. At any rate, uh, as far as my life is concerned, uh, okay. Now we start with your life. Know about okay, my life. Were you, where you, you were born? I was born in Chicago, in 1925. Right. I went to grammar school, to Von Humboldt School. Okay, you went to Von uh, Humboldt went School. To Dooley High School. What do you remember of like your kindergarten, first grade? Life? I, I don't remember my kindergarten, first grade at all. You remember a teacher? No. You had friends? Oh wow, I had a lot of friends. Played a lot of baseball. Uh, in fact, um, when I was in grammar school, my parents wanted me to go to uh, to a Hebrew school, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't want to go to Hebrew school, I wanted to play baseball. So every time I left the house to go to Hebrew school, I get sidetracked and end up playing baseball in the schoolyard. Mm -hmm. uh, this went on for about a month and a half until the rabbi came to the house and said, what happened to your son? Is he sick? He doesn't show up in school. So that, that's why I got caught at that point. So after that, my father didn't trust me to go to Hebrew school as he got a tutor who came to the house. So I couldn't escape from learning what I had to learn for my bar mitzvah. What, what, what position did you usually play when you played baseball? I played first base. The first baseman? Yeah. Um, there was a boys club that I belonged to. Uh, that's the story of uh, the team that I belonged to, boys club. We took first place one year, mm -hmm. 1938, 39, something like that. And um, the reward that we got is we got t-shirts that said, First place, Deborah Boys Club, baseball, something like that. And that was my prize possession. That was my trophy for, for playing first base and winning that game. Uh, well, what happened subsequently, of course, is that when I went away to service, and I was gone for almost three years, uh, my mother threw out the shirt, which would upset me no end at the time. But I said, that was my prize possession. She said, it was a rag. It was all worn out. It was all torn to pieces. So that didn't matter because I used to wear it every day. I was so proud of it. Um, so okay. So uh, what do you remember? Uh, the, you, you went to. You said you went to Tule Elementary School. Uh, and I went to Von Humboldt Elementary Von School. Von Humboldt Elementary School. The president of the graduating class of, uh, of grammar school. How did you get that great position? Uh, well, I was just a popular kid, and uh, I was a nice guy, and everybody liked me, and uh, mm -hmm. they voted me in as president of the class. And I had to make a speech. What did you talk about? You remember? I don't remember now. Okay. <laughs> you know how long ago that I was? know. Well, you know. Maybe it was you know. You uh, remember about the T-shirt? Well, I was in high school. <laughs> that was a T-shirt. That was a dramatic <laughs> moment in my <laughs> life. Uh, in high school, uh, the war broke out while I was in high school. I started mm -hmm. high school in '39, mm -hmm. so I was in high school uh, in '41 when the war broke out, and I was very active. I was the uh, commander in chief of the, of the junior army. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it was, I was a major or something like that. And we had all the usual activities. Uh, our school won a prize for collecting the most keys because they used to have these drives for scrap and rubber and paper and all these things were being collected for use in the, in the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, our school apparently collected the most keys. So 
I ended up being on the radio. Uh, they interviewed me on the radio, uh, talked a little bit about the activities that students are doing for the war effort, uh, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It was just a, you know, one minute blurb. But it was, it was, you know, an experience where I went down to the radio station and the, the guy gave me a script. It was all scripted. I mean, I had to read the script. Right. It, was it wasn't TV, it was radio. Um, and uh, I never made president of the high school class. I was a contender. I was mm -hmm. a contender, but I never made I never made president of the high school class. But I was active there. Did, as a did you play baseball or, or you? Uh, it was... no, no, I wasn't really an athlete. Uh, I, I I peaked out at about thirteen or fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I wasn't much of an athlete. Uh, but you know, I went to gym and I played with the guys and all that sort of thing. But uh, mm -hmm. I was never never really. Athletic. Do you want any um, teams? You, you were just. Uh, what are the what are the what uh, other groups more, were you? More on the nerd side. Was that? Uh, uh, what other groups were you so you in besides this war bond war raising? Well, we had, we had a social group called the Albatrosses. Uh huh. Uh, that was that was fellows who were not the jocks. We were not jocks, mm -hmm. and it was a social club that we would meet and uh, you know do things to go out to. Uh, get something to eat, or we play cards, or we go bowling, or things of that nature. Uh, nothing, nothing very dramatic. Uh, but it was, it was a good time. Uh, my high school days uh, were a satisfying time. Even though the war was on, and there was a, you know, a lot of turmoil, and uh, it was a difficult time in our society. Uh, personally, uh, I was, you know, I had a good time in high school. Of course, I was in school for two years before the war broke out. Uh, How about when you weren't in school? What did you do? What did you do? What, what, did you have any ho Did you have like, any hobbies or activities? Or I mean, what would you do when you said you no, hung out with, you hung out with your friends? That time, by that time, I was starting to work in the bakery. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't, uh, if I wasn't in school, I was probably working in the bakery most of the time. So I didn't have much time for what did you? Other what, activities. what did you do in the bakery? Were you just I you, was a baker. Oh, you actually? Oh yeah, I well, made I bread in the bakery. I would do I would do things in the in the uh, in the bakery itself. I would uh, I would wait on customers. I would uh, I would uh, make breads and different rolls. There were different things that I could bake that I could do. So I was a little bit of a baker. I wasn't a full fledged journeyman baker. But I was a, a little bit of a baker, but I but I you know it was, it was a family business and everybody did something. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, it kept me occupied because the times were, you know, the hours were such that uh, I didn't have too much time free, actually. Did you, did you, did you, uh, I, you know, I had a social life. I mean, I went out, I dated and, and all that sort of thing. So what would you do when you, like, you said you dated in social life? What, what, well, what was that like? I mean, you what, know, what we would do is we'd go you, out, we'd go out to dinner, we'd go bowling, we'd go to right. picnics, we'd, we'd go out to the country. Uh, go swimming, it depends on, you know, what time of year it was. Uh, these were the activities that we did in those days. Uh, I mean, no one sat home and watched television because there wasn't television. You didn't sit so, home and what, listen to the radio? We, we, we had parties. We, 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 I, would sit, I would sit home personally and people would individually do it where they'd sit home and listen to uh, the Laura Finani and, right. and Jack Armstrong and all those sorts of things. Yeah, we did that as a young person. I did that, um, but then you know, in '43, I enlisted in the army. Okay, so you enlisted. Yeah. Okay, now we can go to the army. And so, I, so you graduated high school early. I graduated or? high school in in, in, in June, and right. I went to the army in July, and I, they sent me to Milwaukee. So you, you you enlisted in the army? Yeah. Why didn't you wait till you get drafted? Well, because they said I had an opportunity to. Uh, Joined the Signal Corps, and it was gonna, they were going to teach me whatever it was the Signal Corps did, which I wasn't even too sure at the time. But it, it was academic because if you didn't enlist, you were drafted immediately. I mean, no one, no one stayed. I mean, if you were healthy, you were drafted. I mean, that was it. So I had this opportunity to go to school in Milwaukee if I enlisted. So I enlisted. <coughs> it looked like a good deal. I was up there about six months uh, in Milwaukee, and uh, then I went into active service. Well, that was what, that was I lived in. A, right. In a, what was Milwaukee? Where did you Where did you live? What did you do? I lived in a uh, 
I lived in a private home. I shared a room with another fella, and we uh, uh, we went to class every day. So where was the class? Was it, it was class on radios. Was, radio it, and, and was it a school? Was it a military it base? Was or was it, was it the like University a of uh, Wisconsin had a, It was on their campus, mm -hmm. and they had laboratories there where they showed us how to build radios and take them apart and uh, all the radio technology that existed at that time, mm -hmm. uh, which was still pretty crude actually. Uh, but I did that for about six months, uh, and I got certified as a radio tech, uh, technician of some kind. Right. Uh, and then I went into uh, active duty, and I uh, was sent to Camp Crowder, Missouri. So that was like and a basic, just when you had basic training? Yeah, or the basic teacher? training, and then I went into uh, communications. Do you have any and, interesting, uh, interesting experiences when you were in uh, Milwaukee? or Milwaukee? Well, Milwaukee was boring. I mean, you know, yeah, we had parties. We'd go out for dinner. We, it was basically I went to school and and uh, uh, nothing much more that, that we did. You know, the guys were everybody was very busy going to school and we went home and then we'd go out for a, a, a beer or something and that was that was the lifestyle. I mean, there was nothing, no great social activity. Everybody was from different parts of the country. So what, no, what, what was that like meeting people from different parts of the country for the first time? Oh, I had no problem. I mean, I had no problem. I, uh, I integrated with everybody very well. I had no difficulty with that. <clears throat> anyway, I went into active service. I spent uh, about a year at Camp Crowder. Uh, at that time, the, the, uh, and at that time, I became a lineman. I went into telephones. Why did you become a lineman? Who knows? They, they signed me to, to become a... Because we, you were there for yeah, years. So yeah. I was there. They kept sending me from one training program to another training program. They, My family ended up uh, with a, uh, a designation as a wire chief, which right. is a very high designation. And, so, and you have no idea why they kept... Oh, I have no idea why they do it. They just said tomorrow you... you My own Army experience was unusual in the sense that things would happen to me that I had no idea why they happened. But things would happen that kept delaying by getting into any real combat experience. Uh, they kept sending me for training. Towards the end of the training, they suddenly, myself and seven, many other men, they sent us down to an arsenal to load freight cars with bombs. Mm -hmm. And I was there for like three months, three or four months. I was just doing warehouse work, loading freight cars. And then the bulge broke out. So the next thing they did is they sent me to basic training as an infantryman. After I've gone through all this training as a signalman, they sent me for basic training as an infantryman. And I would actually went overseas as an infantry replacement. Mm -hmm. And we were right up in the front lines. So, well, so uh, when, when, did you, when, when did you get over to Europe? In, in uh, uh, what war ended in 45? I got in there just in early 45. Or well, ended in May, I got there in February. What was the trip across the ocean like? Oh, well, we went over on the Queen Mary. And the only thing I remember, of course, we were stacked five high. I mean, there must have been thousands and thousands of boys. Uh, we, we, uh, the only thing I remember most is that the, our, all the portholes were closed at night. There was no mm -hmm. fresh air, and everybody was smoking these English cigarettes, and it was disgusting. I mean, it was just, yeah, and there were so many men that the toilets got flooded, it was just, it was just, a, and the food was awful, it was English. We used to have herring and, and baked potatoes for breakfast, I mean, it was, it was, it was okay, I mean, it was a ship. The, the only experience I had on, on, on that Queen Mary, we was a nervous liner, is the, they came to me one day and they said, you're on guard duty tonight. And I wondered what, the, what was kind of guard duty? And they had me go outside, and there was an anti-aircraft gun there. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're going to guard this gun. And to this day, I don't know who I was guarding this gun against, because we were in the middle of the ocean, and I didn't know, I had no idea how to use this gun. But that's what they assigned me to. Um, so see, at any rate, I got, I got overseas. Where did you land? In England? or, or? In England, yeah. We went in England, we, we went down to Southampton. We landed in Glasgow, Scotland, actually. Right. We took a train down to Southampton, and then we got on a boat and went across to France. Anything exciting happened or boring or no. just you got it was just no, just you know you're on the train and you're waving at the kids and it's just uh, 
Okay. You're just tra you're just being transported. That's all. Uh, when I got there, I was an infantry replacement and I was put into a unit, and we were just about ready to go into the front lines. Right. And they came and they pulled me and two other guys out of line because there had been an uh, uh, an accident with one of the signal trucks had blown up and they needed replacements in the signal company mm -hmm. because I had this specialty training. They put me into the signal company. So that's how I got into the signal corps, at the, finally at the end of the war. And uh, I was with them for almost a year after the war ended. So, so tell me some of your, some of your humorous or not humorous... Uh, well, uh, okay, so... You know, you're talking about a, a year and a half of uh, yeah. all sorts of adventures. Yeah, a year and a half of all sorts of adventures. Uh, you know, I was climbing pole. I learned how to climb a pole. Uh, I knew a little bit about it, but I really... And I was with another gentleman who was an expert pole climber. He worked for the, uh, the telephone company. Another fellow worked for a power company, so they were good at poles. Right. And they would love to get me up high, you know, 40 or 50 feet up on a pole, which is really right. very high when you get up there. And then they would pull on a wire so the pole would shake. It would scare the hell out of me. Uh, but uh, that, that's the kind of thing we did. I mean, you... you uh, you were always careful because of snipers. They liked to shoot at us when mm -hmm. we were up on the poles. Uh, as a result of which, we seldom used a belt when we went on the poles. So we didn't use a safety belt. We'd wrap one leg around the pole, and that's how we'd haul ourselves up there mm -hmm. uh, and so that we can get down fast and we didn't have to bother with snapping a belt. Um, we, uh, we became part of the occupation force in Germany. Yeah. And, uh, we, lived, we, we were a group of 12 guys and we were on detached duty, mm -hmm. which meant that we were not assigned to any particular unit. We would go wherever they needed us. <clears throat> we were kind of like specialists to do special jobs. And we had a pass where we could travel anywhere at any time, mm -hmm. any place we wanted to go. So uh, we, we ran around, we met the German for girls and we flew around with them. You know, we had that experience, of course, like all the soul, like many of the soldiers had. <laughs> Um, how, how about the? We, we did have one experience where we, we were the unit. Twelve of us took over a little town, mm -hmm. and we took over the brewery, and we were running the brewery in this little town. So we would have all the beer that we wanted. Um, <clears throat> how about the story when, when you uh, when you uh, well at the end of the war when they asked you to do uh, turn back in uh, all, all your wire? Oh well, that was that was. Well, what happened was that on this truck we had about 40 reels of wire, which we used um, wherever it was indicated. Well, at the end of the war now, they, they said we were accountable for those 40 reels. We were supposed to, every time we used it, we were supposed to go back and pick it up and, and keep it or trade it in for new wire. But the, that isn't what happened. What happened is that in the hurry-scurry of doing these things, the wire got left behind. So now we were short about 15 or 20 reels of wire. So what, what we used to do is go to the wire depot and pick up the wire and then go back the next day and give it back to them. And uh, that's how we managed to avoid having to pay for 20 reels of wire. How, how about the story when you, when you pulled the uh, wrong well, wire? The other, that's another little vignette. Uh, as I said, we were supposed to pull the wire up. In other words, when we finished with a one, the unit moved on, the companies moved on, the soldiers moved on. We were supposed to go back and get pick up the wire. Uh, so what we would do is we would hook it onto a winch on the back of the truck, and we wind it up. Well, one time we thought we had the right wire on there that was disconnected at the other end, and as we were winding it up, we saw a fellow running down the road hollering at us, "You've got the colonel's phone." So of course one of the fellows cut the wire and we took off. We didn't want to have to deal with the colonel and his phone. Uh, but I had no real uh, uh, sort of life-threatening adventures in the Army. I didn't feel. Uh, I guess the closest we came was that uh, there were, we did get into some minefields and there were mm -hmm. some people that were killed and I did see some of that. <clears throat> people were blown up um, because of the minefields. Um, and, and that was a problem we had because we go cross country sometimes with the uh, with the trucks to take care of the wires. Yeah, and, and, At any rate, yeah. um, I was finally discharged and came home in 1946. 
I was mm -hmm. overseas almost a year after the war and uh, spent the summer just uh, enjoying myself, uh, going to the park and fooling around with the girls and friends and going out to, to dinners and things of that nature and then started college. Mm -hmm. And then that was my life after that. I, was, I went to college for four years. Okay, well, how, what, was the, uh, what college did you go to? I went to Roosevelt University. Okay, well, why did you go to Roosevelt University? Well, it was a place to get into. It was hard to get into colleges. And uh, I applied and they accepted me, so I went there. <coughs> then I went to the University of Illinois for medical school. And okay, it was the same what, thing. I what, applied and accepted me. So I went what, why did you go? Why did you decide to become? Well, first, what did, what did you study when you were in college? Uh, science. I got a uh, combined degree in uh, biology and chemistry mm -hmm. in college. Uh, I've always been interested in, in, even as a little boy, I was interested in anatomy and I used to dissect frogs and do things like that because it fascinated me how the body was put together. So uh, even though I started college, I was uncertain as to the direction I was going to go. I thought I was going to maybe teach history for one time. But as I went along, I found that my interests really were more in the sciences. And um, so I took the pre-med course and got to medical school. And then after that, went into uh, uh, internship for a year and then a residency for a year. So where, where did you intern? And I interned at the Illinois Masonic Hospital um, and took my residency in OB Guyne at Illinois Masonic mm -hmm. and then went to practice. And uh, I married your mother before I started medical school. We had been dating for three or four years. We met in college. How did, how did you meet? She'll tell you the story of our... Your meeting? Uh, okay, well, I'll get to her. So. Uh, and I practiced medicine for 40-some years. So, uh, you know, you, you, when you were in medical school, you worked at County Hospital? I was, well, I was at County, I was at St. Louis. So, do you, you, you have any good experiences at County Hospital? The only experience that really is worthwhile talking about, I mean, everything was an experience at County Hospital. It was a hospital of 3,000 people, and they were, yeah. they were stacked up in the halls. It was so crowded at that okay. time. They had five buildings. They had a special building for infectious disease, a special building for children, a special building for psychiatry. Um, I could, I, the most memorable thing about my training there was my first delivery. Mm -hmm. and that story was that... that I was in the delivery room with a resident. I had never seen a delivery before at that point of a baby. And the resident said, I don't think she's going to deliver, and went out to get a cup of coffee. And at that moment, the mother has the baby. And there I am alone with her. And, and the nurse, you forgot about the nurses. And, and I had to catch it. Well, just before she delivered, the head nurse walked in with a dozen or so student nurses and asked me if they could watch the delivery. And of course, I said in my naivety that she's not going to deliver now. The resident left. How yeah, can she deliver? And at that moment, the woman gave a grunt, and out came the baby, which I fortunately didn't drop. I knew enough to hold on to it, and I knew about clamping the cord and all that. And after I was done, uh, the head nurse said, very nice delivery, doctor, and walked out with her student nurses. That was my very first delivery. Since then, I might delivered two or 3,000 babies at a very active practice mm -hmm. for years after that. Um, okay, so so okay, then you do that, and then you were any, any interesting experiences when you were a resident? Well, uh, well, well, when you uh, were no, when you were an intern, weren't you yeah, on the first as an in intern and resident in those yeah. days? You worked you worked thirty six on and twelve off, so you had no time for anything. Mm -hmm. You were you started one morning, you worked that day, uh, you worked all night. Uh, you had to be available in the morning, the following morning. You probably wrap things up around 2 in the afternoon, and then you were off until the following morning. So you were on for 36 and off for 12, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you were on call every other night. So it was, when, a tough, when, it was a tough time. I hardly saw your mother during that time. When did, when did you one of the first interns that we actually got paid? No, they were getting paid before. I got okay. $25 a month. But uh, I, they, were, they were paid before for me too. Uh, uh, you got to go back probably pre-war when they were just giving them room and board. Mm -hmm. They weren't giving them any money at all. But I think after the war they started paying the residents and the interns a token amount. $25 a month was a, a, a lot of money by any means. Um, and uh, 
Okay, so, so you do your residency, and, do, and do your that, internship. And, and that was my practice, and then I went to practice, and I practiced for 40-some okay. years. Okay, so where did where you start, where did your first practice? I, well, my first practice was in a uh, uh, neighborhood uh, industrial clinic, and I practiced for about a year. Uh, and then I kind of learned some of the nuts and bolts of practice there. And then I had an opportunity to join another doctor who was a, a year older than me. Uh, and I joined him and his father in practice. And three why, why, why did you, uh, so how did you get that first job? You were just... Uh, they, I was approached. The fellow who owned the clinic came to me and said, would I be interested in working there? Mm -hmm. And I thought at the time that it was uh, something we, we, I wanted to we, do. Were you looking for work? I don't know if or? I was looking for a job. I, I Semi-looking. Yeah, I mean, it was... You are getting to the end of your residency? I was getting to the point where, not the end of the residency, but getting to the point where I felt I needed to go into practice. So I took the job, worked there for about a year, and then... What was that like? A year, a year, maybe a little more, and then left and went to private practice. Why, why did you leave that place? Uh, because there was no future there. It oh, was, it was a, just it was a job? an industrial clinic, and, and doctors would come and go, you know, every, every two months, and... And the owners weren't about to allow you to have any ownership uh, in the practice, so it was it was a dead end kind of position. Right. It just served a purpose of my earning some money and uh, learning a little bit about practice and learning about the uh, uh, the business of practice. Okay. Uh, and then I joined the Dr. Khan and his father. Okay. And what did you join them? Well, they they approached also approached me and. Uh, wanted me uh, in their practice. They were very busy and they needed more more help. Uh, the practice was really a very big practice. How did you meet them? I mean, how did they know? I knew them from the hospital. They were on staff in the side. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, I knew them and I knew their reputation was good. As doctors, they had a very good reputation. And uh, uh, I joined them. And I stayed with them. Uh, I didn't want to go into all the details of uh, my practice, my God. Yeah, I want to story of your life. <laughs> well, to do that, yeah. um, we'll have to be here a few hours. Right, well, we, we can do that another time. This is more of the grandparents thing. Okay. So right. we'll, 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 we'll talk about we'll, I'll give you some time to, to rehearse on your, on your lives. Okay, all right. Well, you know, because you're talking about 40 or 50 years of, of you know, of yeah. intense living yeah. uh, with all sorts of things. Um, so you so can sit down and say, write that up. But uh, I think you got a flavor for hopefully about my parents, my my uh, my parents, and a little touch about uh, my grandparents, a little bit that I know. You said they had, they had a. What, what, what did your grand your grandparents do when they came over to the United States? You said they did a tea shop and. Well, he never came here. My, oh, oh. my father's parents never right. came to America. He right. was the only one of his whole family that came to America. Right. None of them came. My other grandfather, my other grandfather, he did nothing. He came here and he would... He retired. He just did nothing. I mean, he lived with, he usually lived with one of the children. There were like five children right. over here. So he would live with one of the children. And uh, apparently he had some kind of income, some reason, I don't know. But, but he never worked. I never did anything. What, what you, you know what he did in, 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 uh, in Europe? Uh, I think he... he uh, you know, they, they were like brokers, like jobbers, where they buy things and sell things. That's the best mm -hmm. that, the best that I never got very specific. Um, so, yeah, you, you didn't tell me much about your mother. You just my said, mother, uh, well, all I can do. stop for a minute. Sure. Okay. Like so you, My mother came to America because, uh, with her sister uh, because of... Uh, being, being, as far as I know, being harassed when she was over in Europe. Mm -hmm. So she came here and uh, she worked in the garment industry uh, until she met my father and they, uh, she got pregnant and they had a child almost the next year. Right. Uh, my sisters were born in 1920. Mm -hmm. They were married in 1919. So she did, and then they went into this bakery business. And my mother was very active in the bakery. I mean, she really was like the head sales lady in the bakery. and. Uh, and of course, she raised the children, and she was home with uh, for us uh, pretty much. You know, she the bakery was so close to the to our apartment that she was underneath. It was just downstairs, really, virtually. 
that uh, she would be there in the morning for us when we got up, and she would be there when we got home from school, and of course she was there in the evenings. Uh, and she did, you know, all the usual mother things, cooking. Uh, we always had a shot of dinner. She always made a, a fancy uh, Friday night dinner. Mm -hmm. where she lit the candles and said the prayer, and uh, it was always a full-fledged Friday night dinner. Your father said, uh, and you know, my thing? father would say some prayers. And, did, did he? Did he? Uh, I do have a question. When he when he said the kiddush, did he stand up or he sat down? <laughs> Mark, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, he did it every week. So. Uh, I I think he I think he did it sitting down. Okay. I think he did it sitting down. I don't think he stood up. Okay. Um. Any rate, um, and my mother, you know, uh, she she got ill about the 1940s. She she was ill for about 15 years. In mm -hmm. 46, she had uh, cancer of the breast, and she was weak after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she had a bad heart, so she was really ailing for about the last 15 years of her life. I'd say she was ailing. She was in and out of hospitals and going to doctors and, right. and really had, was limited in terms of what she could do. Uh, uh, but she was very much a mother uh, prior to that time. Um, Did she like embarrass you in front of your friends and no, do usual stuff? No, never, never embarrassed me. No. Was she interested in what you were doing? And no, my family weren't particularly interested in what I was doing. I mean, it was a very casual interest. Uh, probably my mother more than father or anybody else, but even then it was it was a very casual. I mentioned I went on the radio that time yeah. and they forgot to listen to the radio to hear because mm -hmm. I told them I was going to be on the radio. Uh, so those things I felt, I really felt somewhat uh, uh, not neglected but uh, unimportant. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, this was something I had to overcome in my adulthood. Um, but that pretty much is, is my the background, you know, and a little touch of myself. Uh, I think your mother has some interesting uh, stories to tell. Okay, well, let me then change tapes.